I have been wanting to do this for a while. Uh, it's kind of a joke around our office at F4DC that this is a meeting that Ed's been trying to get people to have for three years. And we finally got to the point where we just decided that, well, you got to decide a year and a half ahead of time, set a date, and then I guess we'll just finally do it, and we're doing it. And I am incredibly happy that we have done it and that we have assembled this room full of folk made up of grantees and, again, our dearest friends and movement associates from around the country that we wanted to make sure we had in contact with our grantees uh, as part of the work that we're doing. Uh, I want to start off first by saying that we have to always respect the fact that we're on stolen land. Uh, I will assure you that Hall River State Park, much like the state of North Carolina and every place else just about in the Western Hemisphere is stolen, has been occupied for quite a long time from some people who were probably by and large killed. Something we always need to keep in mind. That we're living in an area that while it was not one of the most hellacious places for slavery, nevertheless had it. Uh, there are people here from, from the depths of slave areas, uh, from where it was, slavery was hell. Uh, but it was hell everywhere when you're kidnapped and forced to work and the product of your labor is taken by somebody else. So, um, so we're here kind of in honor of the oppressed, exploited, and slandered people of the world who remain with us. Um, so F4DC is an organization that Marnie and I, Marnie said, hey, look, can you help me figure out what to do with this pile of money that my father's leaving me? And it's, it's in the booklet. There's an article on that in a little pamphlet outside that describes that process. And I said, yeah, if I have to. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had been doing movement work for years and years and years without grants, working full-time job doing something else and spending the rest of the day doing that. And so I like to tell people I've been doing this for about 50 years. I'm 66, and I will assure you from time I was 16 on, I mean, whether it was a Vietnam War or uh, school integration or black studies or some other war, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, uh, something was going on wrong that I was working on, uh, and pretty hard. Um, but what F4DC got to be an opportunity to take the fact that when I, when I wasn't working, and even as I was working, I was thinking, trying to figure out like what is it that we ought to be doing, and we had these ideas about what ought to be going on in the world. And one of the biggest ones we had was there ought to be more democracy. And that's a pretty simple sounding thing. But the idea that people themselves have a capacity and, and, and the right, and quite frankly, who else should speak for what people ought to do? So I mean, isn't democracy one of the main things you always want to promote and develop? So the idea of uh, promoting more democratic, more authentically democratic activity in communities and, uh, and in social justice organizations was what we centered uh, this work around. But I'm not gonna talk about that tonight either. I really do wanna talk about some of the ideas that have guided our work because I wanna use this as a jumping off point for all of us spending a day and a half, to, a couple of days together, once you add up all the pieces, talking about the ideas that guide our work and just get this rich, rich amount of experience and thinking in this room from the incredible organizations that people are from and the incredible movements that they're a part of. Uh, tied into each other so something can emerge out of this bigger than what any of us are capable of bringing into this room, because we very much believe in, in emergent processes. For F4DC, one of the big ideas that we have spent a lot of time using it to help prioritize our work and focus it is this idea of the resistance between the relationship between resistance, adv advocacy, and doing for self, those three things. And there are a lot of people, if you ask them, what do you do? It's like, well, I do resistance and advocacy work. And any number of people will unashamedly tell you that all day long, as though that's kind of the, covers the whole scope of what anybody ought to be doing, the resistance and advocacy. And it was very clear to us that if what you say when someone says, what are you doing is resistance and advocacy, then you have left something out that you might ought to be doing. I'm not going to say absolutely that everyone should, but I think it's incredibly important is those things we can do for ourselves. And it's, it's, it's around, I mean, we resist the power that could crush us and could stop us from doing what we need to do. We have to resist that or we get crushed. 
We advocate to the power that has resources that we need, because we need to direct it so those resources might be used in, in, in our favor. We need to do that because there are resources that have been stolen that are all over the place and concentrated in places where we don't own them, and we have to advocate for that. But in the final analysis, we have to be concerned with what is it we are capable of doing for ourselves. And in fact, that's why you want to be able to resist so you stay alive to do it and advocate so that there's some resources to do it with so that you can do for yourself. And if you were ever in a position where you had access to what it was that you needed, then you would replace all of that with the fact that you would just be doing it for yourself and happy about it. That to be able to live a full life of subsistence, and I don't use this in any kind of diminutive way. I'm not talking about the subsistence that leaves you barely alive. I'm talking about living a good life. Um, as some people in Latin America talk about, um, uh, how do you pronounce it? Bon vivir? Huh? Bien vivir. That's the subsistence that we ought to be able to do, not having to fight off attacks from power all the time and not having to beg anybody. So that's kind of what we're pointing to it, and that's an important kind of concept for us. But the other important concepts that have come up and that we have tried to name and use in our work, one is the idea that communities can be their own developers, that you don't have to have outside somebody with a pile of money to come in and do something in your community. You ought to be able to develop something in community on the basis of people in the community collecting their own resources and their own ideas and energy and doing that. So we talk about that CAD, community as developer. Uh, another thing we, we kind of come up with about democracy is this idea of SASH, that we all have to develop the spirit, the art, the science, and the habits of democracy. And then when you leave one of those out, you can corrupt the system. Because if we're not guided by a spirit of democracy, I will, show you, I will assure you that I can game almost any democratic process you come up with if that's what I'm trying to do. So I've heard people say, well, you know, the only way to do democratically is consensus. I have seen people game consensus <laughs> process. Has anyone seen that before? Uh, OK. Yeah, consensus processes get gamed. Uh, voting processes get gamed, all because people don't have the spirit of even trying to work together. So one of the things we'll tell people is that the key part of democracy is thinking together. It's not registering your opinion. It's not making sure that everybody in this room gets to know what you were thinking before you came in this room, but it's about coming in this room and using this as an opportunity to think together with the people in this room about what's the best for all of us. And so thinking together is a different kind of democracy than what most people even think about. Because for a lot of people, the word democracy just means making sure you know what I think and me getting my way most of the time. <laughs> then it's, you know, but no, there's some deeper ways to look at and understand that. But we also borrowed very deep ideas from other people. One of the ones we've borrowed and made a lot out of is the idea of the importance of the cities in the 21st century being democratic, just, and sustainable. And fortunately, we have people here from the Right to the City Alliance that has used that language that we have found very, very valuable in our work. And so we'll have opportunities to look at that. But there's a chart there uh, over in the corner about a movement cycle. That's a piece of work that another organization that is represented again in this room by Pablo, um, Movement Let Net Lab. Yeah. Um, has done in terms of looking at how movement cycles operate. So ideas like this, you know, big ideas, end up challenging and focusing what we're talking about because, again, we're not talking about coming here to talk about navel-gazing. We're talking about the ideas that people use in order to determine what it is that they ought to be doing that's going to make the most difference to get done what needs to be done for the people that we care about. Um, <laughs> I've been in so many discussions where somebody will say, why won't anybody do anything? <laughs> and I think about it, it was like people are doing something all day, every day. I mean, everybody is always doing something. So that's not what they mean. And what I realize what people really do mean is, why doesn't somebody do either what they want done? Or something, the very best of it is, why didn't somebody do effect, something effective to make for a certain kind of change and often that needs a different process. That needs a process of reflection to take place and thought. 
to decide what it is to do and thinking together. Uh, a dear friend of a lot of us in this room passed away very recently uh, in her 100th year, Grace Lee Boggs. And uh, one of the things that she is known to have said to some people that I think helps guide the spirit of this meeting, which is that a lot of times progressives overestimate the role of activism and underestimate the role of reflection. Now, I'm not somebody that's going to try to stand here and tell you that activism isn't important, because that would be a denial of much of my life. But it is the activism that is guided by the reflection that we have to do. So there are meetings that are planning meetings, where what you really need to do is get down and plan the next thing you're going to do. There are some other meetings that need to be deeply reflective meetings that help us understand where we are so that we can move forward. Um, and it's that level of thinking about ideas and idea generation that would lead us to what I came up with as a title for this presentation. What I decided I would call this was the power of ideas and the idea of power. Now, the problem with that title, though, is that after I came up with it, it sounded so cool to me, I couldn't figure out what to put in it. <laughs> because it's a very big topic. <laughs> I mean, ideas are indeed potentially very, very powerful. Uh, and in particular, the question of power is something that is a very, very broad question, the ideas about which we could spend a whole long time talking about. So I have been working on it um, <laughs> for the last couple of months. Um, and it's, it's a presentation that is deeply affected. Has anyone ever had a problem, what do you call, uh, the last thing I read, itis? <laughs> Where the thing you want to talk about on a given day is this last incredibly powerful thing that you read? And I'm lucky, because I think the last thing I read is one of the most significant things I've been needing to read lately. <laughs> so that when I talk to you a little about it, that it'll, it'll put us all in a good place to figure out how to move forward. Because it's deeply related to that chart on the wall. It's deeply related to some questions that came up when I was in upstate New York with some people from, uh, from Detroit. It's deeply related to some questions that I have on my mind every time I go to Jackson, Mississippi. It's deeply related to what I think about in Greensboro, North Carolina. And in particular, it's deeply related to thinking about the fact that while we are in the United States, and most of us are on, in organizations that focus a lot of their work in the United States, that the problems that we have and are facing and fighting in the United States can't be thought of just in terms of what's going on inside the boundaries of this country. This country is embroiled and plays a very, very special role in a world system. And it's a big system, it's an incredibly complex system, and there's every reason to believe that that system is in deep crisis. And a lot of times we spend time talking about systems, various systems, um, systemic racism, um, the prison system, the school system, and we, we really need to be careful and think of these things as what they are, which are subsystems. Because the only way these things make any sense in terms of having any real meaning is how they're connected to this world system that's going on, of which the United States is a very peculiar part of. I used to raise the people the question, like, what do you want to do to be equal? Because a lot of us are certainly not treated equally. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. I can tell you all something about in inequality. It's like, well, what does it mean, though, to be treated as equal in the United States? Because we're living in the home of the greatest thieves ever in history, who've not only stolen this place that, that we're all living in, <laughs> stole the labor to work it, but are currently in the process of stealing stuff all over the world. So is equality in the home of a thief that you split the booty in half with them? I mean, it's like, hey, look, <laughs> you got this silverware, let's, you know, I won't, Three forks, <laughs> you take three. I mean, what does it mean to be equal in the home of a thief? And again, if you are as we are, as many of us are, like servants in the home of a thief, what in the world are we looking to do? Are we just simply looking to change our status so that we match up with what the thief is doing? 
And if you don't look at the situation we're in as a part of what's going on in the world, that's what you can often be left almost with thinking about doing. And in fact, if you listen to the rhetoric of any number of organizations, that's what they will tell you. Like, this is what we have to do so America can keep its competitive edge. Competitive edge? <laughs> does that mean nuclear superiority? I mean, is, um, does that mean the number of ships that it would take to blockade you know, almost any country on Earth in terms of controlling their trade policies? Does it mean enough capital piled up so that you can distort uh, the economies of big places, small places, any places you want to, anywhere in the world? Is this the edge that you're trying to say that we should educate kids in school so that they can find their role in this system so that they can be a part of that? I'll have none of it. <laughs> so I used to be involved a lot in school reform efforts. And I kept hearing over and over again people who said as the goal of what they were trying to do something I found absolutely irresponsible and ridiculous that I didn't want my children to have anything to do with. And so success would have been to succeed in that where those are the goals. Not for me. No, no, no. So it makes it very, very difficult to do part of what we have to do. But this is the thinking that we have to engage in, even as we live in a situation where a lot of people are hurting, and much of our responsibility is to ameliorate the pain, if we can, because we care about people and we don't want to see them hurting. One of the challenging things for us is to make a distinction between genuine pain and suffering and the ending of certain levels of entitlement that are connected to the theft. Because they're not the same, and a lot of people can scream just as loud when, you chop a, when you're cutting at their entitlement as they could if you were actually stab, standing on their foot. So we have to be careful. That's, again, where these ideas are so very, very important and where we have to dig very, very deeply into the situation we're facing. There are a lot of ideas that are out here that are potentially very confusing, and we can make some mistakes that are pretty serious on. There's a certain kind of way that the relationship, for instance, between racism, which is alive, well, vicious, and dangerous, and an acceptance of race, which is the essentialized differences between people, that some folks think it generates racism as opposed to recognizing that it is indeed racism that generates these ideas of race which are fundamentally flawed. And so one of the kind of ideological challenges we have is when people want to say, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Well, it's like, maybe, but I think that there's some of the things that you might be talking about that would cause us to go in one direction when we ought to be going in another and perhaps we need to be very, very careful with what we understand about exactly what we're talking about. One of the ways people try to deal with this, and I'm talking about this idea issue, is this thing about, well, let's define the words we're using very, very carefully, because what the words really mean, as though somehow meaning is deeply embedded somewhere inside a word. My notion is that meaning is something that people have, and we attach words to, to try our best to express. And where words get us in trouble is when we use the same word to mean two different things and then end up saying one and the person hears the other, right? And so at that point, it calls upon us to have a discussion where we go more deeply into exactly what do you mean. And at some points, it'll even require us to say, well, then we need two different words to talk about that because I had that discussion with somebody the other day about violence. And someone was saying, well, those words are violence. And I will assure you, that I will bet you that people in this room who would, are likely to say that, and don't y'all get so mad at me, you can beat me up tomorrow for this, but I hope you just beat me up with words. <laughs> because, <laughs> because the distinction I want to make is that I want to have two different things to represent when you hit me in the head with a stick and when you say something that, 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 that bothers me really badly, even if it bothers me you know, deep in my soul. I want to have a different thing because there's different treatments for it, there are different remedies for it. And, you know, it's like the United States wants to take words to be violence so anybody who issues a threat somewhere, the United States can respond with a drone. 
and said, well, they committed violence against us. Wow, because they said something that, that sounded dangerous, or he said something that you know, insulted the integrity of American democracy or something. And say, I want to have two different words for that. And that's the reason why, to me, it's fairly important, because I want to be able to tell an elementary kid who said that somebody across the room looked at him funny, and he goes up and slugs him. I want to tell him how that's different from hitting somebody back who actually does slap him. And I need two different words for that, right? And so I'm saying that one of the things we do is a kind of a shorthand on how we handle ideas is we'll say, oh, everybody knows, oh, yeah, but, but that is violence. It really is. It's like, okay. And we have to be careful because our words have the capacity to carry meanings, some of which are unintended. And that's just one of the things I want us to be thinking about as we go through this work. The other thing I want to say is that uh, there's a lot of stuff as it relates to, to race and, and <laughs> this whole relationship between uh, segregation uh, and separation. And uh, there's a fine book that's been written that I really would like to refer people to. And there's a list out in the hall for people to put on as the name of books that they're reading, that they're getting a lot out of. And I think that this book will be, a, it's a challenge to me. It's a book called uh, Racecraft where a couple of African-American uh, historian and sociologists have spent an incredible amount of their life analyzing how this belief in race, belief that there's some really serious difference between people, and the belief that that race is what generates racism, as opposed to realizing that there's oppressive, exploitative systems that are intended to be used, quite frankly, to steal from folk, and that they have been used over periods of time to create an idea of race as a means of justifying them. That book is one of the things that's really helpful, but it is so difficult because the idea of race has become so pervasive that we all think that we have to acknowledge it, rectify it, yield to it in such a kind of way that we don't recognize sometimes the way that we're helping to perpetuate part of the exact problem that we're really intending on fighting. I, I'm pretty comfortable with where the actual intentions of most of the folk here in this room are. Um, and so I, I feel comfortable saying that. And I recognize that what I'm saying is somewhat controversial. And I figure if I didn't say anything that disturbs somebody a little bit, I have wasted my time and yours tonight. So, but the other thing I want to spend us a little time talking about is this question of power. Some people have almost brought up the idea that we should be afraid of power, uh, as though power is a bad thing. And uh, think about a match, fire. You know, fire, fire can warm you at night. Fire can clear a field that needs to be cleared. Fire can also burn down your house. Fire can torture somebody. So power in and of itself doesn't tell you how it's going to be used. But because fire is such a powerful potential tool that we can't have the attitude that, 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 that fire is bad. And so I would say to people that when we're thinking about power, we're going to have to learn how to be comfortable with matches. <laughs> we have to learn how to be comfortable with matches and respectful of them, recognizing how that power can be used. But for all of us, the issue of power is how do we make the changes in the world that need to be made? Because on the one hand, I want to argue that, that, that power is what it requires to change something that needs to be changed. And everybody has some power, because we've all been able to change something in our life, right? So I, you know, this hyperbole that folk use, which is all and none, like there's some people with all the power and some other people have no power, it's like, you know, give me a break. We have to really be careful what we're saying and thinking. But one of the things about uh, power in particular is that some things are already changing. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> that there's some things that are part of dynamic systems that are going through changes of, of coming into being, periods of relative stability, periods of chaos, and then dying, just like any other living system. And so one of the things for us to understand, and I hope we'll get a chance to get into deeply over, over this weekend and some of the discussions, because a number of people know more than a little bit about this, and way more than we can talk about in a couple of minutes, is that, uh, that the role that power plays is, is dependent on where you are in that system. Because what power can do in a period of stability and equilibrium, and what power can do in a period of chaos and rapid change, and what power does at a point of almost system collapse are different kinds of things. 
So one of the things I figured out just the other day, it has to do with uh, our RAD analysis. And this may be almost clear if I show it to you. Then the period of equilibrium, you don't have to do all much resistance because the system has already figured out how to, how to deal with it. It's not trying to crush you right then. A lot of advocacy could easily be in place, so it's higher up here on the scope. And people doing for themselves don't see the need because the system in equilibrium, things are working kind of all right. And who knows, between 1945 and 1970, there were some communities, certainly not all, for which that was the feeling that that's how things were going when things were smooth and this system was, this world system was more in equilibrium than it is now. At a point in crisis, stuff gets dangerous. You can easily be crushed. So resistance takes a very, very high uh, role. The system in crisis doesn't have all that much to buy you off with. So your advocacy work might take a much lesser importance because it, the, the resources aren't there, the surplus is not there, the profits. The uh, philanthropy doesn't have the money that it has in other periods. So your advocacy work, but because people's lives are hard, there are a lot of opportunities and reasons to have folks learning how and figuring out how to do things for themselves. But then at this bifurcation, at the point of, of, of collapse, the world is either going to go toward barbarism or it's going to go toward a better world. And depending on which way it goes, it really has a lot to do with how power was exercised, particularly in this period of crisis, where the small things we do are amplified in their, in their measure. So there's some analyses of that and thinking about that. Some of the thinking about that movement cycle that's there on that chart will have something to do with it. We need to look into it very, very deeply and carefully and see uh, if we can come away from here understanding some more about how to even think about what we're doing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm needing to wrap up because I really do want us to take some time and answer some questions. And the best form of this is certainly not somebody talking at you with all of the ways I can formulate this and, and think you could hear it. The best form of this is to spend a day and a half talking about asking a lot of questions getting a lot of inputs, thinking about what the nature of the current world system is right now, where we fit into it, what types of power we can uh, have, what kind of movements we need to develop going beyond the organizations that we have that take us to the point of gathering the kind of power that's actually required to make an important shift so that as the system goes in crisis, that it doesn't fundamentally go in the way toward barbarism and the rise of Donald Trump is emperor or something. Uh, it could happen. And Don Lemon would be his chief spokesperson. Anyway, we have to find a way to prevent that by building organizations with the kind of power needed to transform the world that we're, we're involved in. And that's why I'm so glad to see so many of you here in this room to talk about the big ideas that help guide your work. Thank you very much.